Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dearest brothers and sisters. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya il mursaleen nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-deeni thumma amma ba'd. Just to mention the nature of this talk is going to be a bit sensitive. And I see, mashallah, young children here as well. We are telling the parents from the beginning, it's up to them. The children will hear certain things which will be a bit sensitive. So we're making it yeah, clear now. Because the nature of the topic is that certain things need to be spoken about. And if they're not, then perhaps the topic is not being done justice to. Inshallah. Tayyip. Everyone is sitting still. So everyone is agreed. Alhamdulillah. Brothers and sisters, this topic is a big issue. You know, I was thinking, subhanAllah, Allah Jalla has sent prophets from the beginning until the Prophet ﷺ, and each one of them came to tackle the most important issues of the time. And the most important issue of the time, Taban, was always to do with people's relationship with Allah, at tawheed However, you find some prophets, they came to deal with other social issues as well. Does anyone know of a prophet mentioned in the Quran who came to his people, he gave da'wah about a tawheed but about something else too? Anyone else? Another, a prophet that was mentioned in the Quran, Allah Jalla said, he came to his people, he not only told them about worshipping Allah alone, but he also told them about something else, something they were doing bad in the society. Father Shaykh. Lut alayhi salam. Lut alayhi salam, wallahi ajeeb. His name, I think, is mentioned 21 or 23 times in the Quran. Every time Allah mentions Lut alayhi salam, He mentions the sin of sodomy that He came to denounce. And it seems as though Allah never mentioned the da'wah of Tawheed when it came to Lut alayhi salam. Check this yourself in the Quran. Ajib. What does that show us? It shows us that he came, he came to warn people about the most prevailing sin of the time. Yeah, and that's difficult because if you want to talk about some issues in society, some issues people will not really mind too much. Some issues people find very sensitive. And some issues people find offensive when you talk about them because they're part and parcel of the society. Lut Islam came to speak about the issue of the time. Another prophet also came to speak about something that was to do with Tawheed and something else to do with his society. Anyone know? Father Shaykh. Shu'aib. Shu'aib Islam, he came to speak about the business practices of his people. Fraud that was being done in his time became rampant. In our times, one of the big ills is to do with sexual ethics. Yeah? Sexual ethics, gender relations, this has become, wallahi, one of the biggest, biggest musibas of our time. Do you agree with me or not? No one can escape this musibah. You can't escape it in the schools, let alone at home. It is everywhere. And this today is part of this huge problem where shahwa, the human nature to gratify its sexual desires, has become one of the hallmarks of society in our times. So there's, there's two things I want to mention before we get into the talk. And by the way, the talk inshallah will speak firstly about the dangers of this evil. And secondly, some advice. How does a person, how does a person protect himself from this? How does a person who is already suffering from this help himself? Or perhaps how do you reach out to somebody else that you may know who is struggling with this sin? Before we go into that, I just want to mention, subhanAllah, today, today, I was speaking to one of my shaykhs and he told me that a young brother approached him in the masjid. After the salah, he came up to him and he said, Shaykh, I need your advice. 
I have a big problem. He said, I am addicted to pornography. And the situation becomes so bad that I watch six hours of this every day. And it has reached a point where I cannot hold down a job because of this problem and I've lost my job. What do you advise me? This brother, the brother who is coming to pray his salah in the masjid. Yeah. But before we speak about the dangers, I just want to make two points. The first point is that as, as Muslims, we can tackle any issue, but we tackle it with dignity. We speak about these things, even though we're speaking about indecency, we should speak about them in a dignified way. You know, subhanAllah, you may have experiences with the mashayikh here, when they, for example, teach fiqh, and they teach, for example, about najasa, about what one should do when they relieve themselves. They, you may hear them say, Akramakumullah. Have you heard this? Why the shaykh is talking about yani, how to go to the loo and follow the Islamic etiquettes and he's saying in the middle, may Allah honor you. Why is that? Because the shaykh, he's saying we're speaking about something which is not really becoming of dignified people. But we need to. We can compensate for that by asking Allah to honor you all. And this is an important point because what happens is that this issue is not being tackled by most du'at. It's not being spoken about much at all. So some people, they get upset with this. They say, why, isn't, why don't the Maulanas and the, the Maulvis and talk about these things? If they're not going to, we are going to. And when they do, Allah is no holds barred. And they speak about details which Allah is questionable. In a manner which is questionable, irresponsible, going into details, there's no need to. So as a Muslim, we should tackle the issues, but we should do so in a dignified way. Allah spoke about so many things in the Quran. Allah spoke about matters to do with intimacy, sex. Allah spoke about matters to do with impurity, hayd. But when He did, Allah spoke about it in the most noble and dignified way. Yeah, this is an important point. Secondly, one of, the, uh, um, one of the aims I hope to achieve from this short dars by Allah Tawfiq and help is that we walk out of this masjid not just knowing about the danger of the sin and perhaps knowing how to deal with it but also with an appreciation of the wisdom of Allah and His religion. You know, many of us we may know what's right and wrong according to Islam, but we lack an appreciation as to why Allah made this haram. In fact, some of us, when we think about things that Allah has prohibited, we think, oh man, why, why is it? Islam is always making things difficult for us. Astaghfirullah alayhim. Or thinking worse than that, these rulings, laws, they're not meant to benefit us. They're, meant to, they're just making our life difficult. Am I right in saying this? Do people think this? When they think about religion, most people, they think religion is just making our life difficult. And subhanAllah, this couldn't be further from the truth. And this topic, in fact, will help us to appreciate how wrong that is. Because when we see the way this sin destroys lives, individually, on a family level, societal, and in the akhirah, we will appreciate what Allah said, stay away from it. Yeah, Wallahi, this insha'Allah, we hope that this will be one of the outcomes of this dars insha'Allah. So, you know, we live in confusing times. Anybody would think that pornography is bad. No sensible person would think this is uh, in any way, shape, way or shape good. Yeah. However, you will be surprised the times we are living in, there are people who advocate that this indecency in fact is not such a big deal it may even be any they might even be indifferent to it you know last year last year on BBC Radio 4 there was a debate taking place you know what the topic of the debate was does pornography empower women yes or no can you imagine and it gets worse for women 
on a panel debating this issue, meaning some of them actually do feel that it does empower women. Only women on the panel. Now the host, she says, can we have a show of hands? How many people are against the motion that pornography empowers women? 80% of people put their hands up and said, yeah, of course, it's degrading of women. How does it empower them? No, we are against it. She said, okay. Then one lady spoke against it. Then she said, now we'd like to welcome another lady. She is, and they had a, a snazzy name, a snazzy title for her. Ultimately, she was the director of a, another pornography, uh, um, what do we call it? Um, company. So she used to manufacture uh, these filthy things. And she was a director. She said, well, I see it differently. She said, I feel that there are some bad practices in the pornography industry. However, the way we do things is different. And in fact, we are celebrating the identity of women. We are enhancing their sexuality and we are actually empowering them. And for two minutes, for two minutes, she made some passionate speech about how it's actually a good thing for women. Now, after that, the host, she said, we would like to take another survey. How many people now believe that pornography empowers women? You know what? 60% of people switched and they said, we believe it does empower women. now." Two minutes. And people swayed from saying it's bad to saying it's good. Can you believe it? And you know what that shows us? That shows us that subhanAllah, without revelation from Allah, human beings are lost cause. That's what it shows us. Human beings, they're a lost cause. Tayyib. So, I wanted to make a few points about, about this. First of all, my brothers and sisters, uh, we cannot be in denial. The scale of this problem is absolutely mind-boggling. I've done some research for you. I want to share it with you. They said now, pornography sites, they get more visitors than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. It is, only, it is second only to YouTube right now. And in fact, 30% of all data transferred across the internet is to do with pornography. According to a YouGov survey, one third of UK children have watched explicit pornographic images on the internet by the age of 10. 10 years old, one third. And it is claimed that the average teenager watches 50 clips a week. And for every 4,000 movies made by Hollywood, 11,000 are made about porn. In 2009, a professor wanted to do a study. What is the effect of pornography on young boys? In order to study, he needed to test a sample of boys that do watch this against a sample of boys that don't. You need to have the standard. However, that's where the problem began. He could not find a group of boys that didn't watch it. <laughs> I'm not making this up. He could not find a group of boys that didn't watch it. Therefore, he could not do the experiment to see the effect of pornography. He said it is like every boy smoke cigarettes. Then you want to find out what's the effect of cigarettes on young boys. You've got nothing to compare it to. Because it's the same problem we encountered when it came to pornography. And that was back in 2009. My brothers, you may be surprised to find out that watching these things leads to many problems. It leads to problems to do with your mind. To do with your body to do with your family, to do with your reputation, to do with the way you see the women in your lives, like your mother, your children, your siblings, and worst of all, the way you see your own wife, or wives perhaps. And also, and also, what is worse than all of these harms? What is worse than harming your mind, your body, your family, society. What is worse than this? What do you think? Is there anything worse than this? The heart? There's something even worse than this. 
What is worse than this? Yes. Sorry? Shirk in general, of course, but this sin itself, in terms of its harm, the worst harm it brings to a person is that it earns the anger of Allah. And there can be nothing worse than this. This sin could land, could qualify you for punishment in the grave and in the hellfire. May Allah protect and preserve us all. Subhanallah. I want to go through these one by one. How does it harm the mind? First of all, appreciate the science behind this. When someone watches these indecent images, there is a neurotransmitter released called dopamine. And dopamine is released in the brain, it's responsible for the pleasure senses. It's the same neurotransmitter that is released when someone takes drugs like cocaine. However, the thing about dopamine is the body becomes addicted to it. And the addiction it, it increases such that the same amount of dopamine is not enough to elicit the same amount of pleasure. Therefore, the person needs to do more of the habit in order to get the same effect. And what that means is that a person who is watching these things, he needs to number one, watch more or watch more extreme versions. Yeah. So this becomes almost like a trap, an addiction. Some behavioral psychologists said that the addiction to pornography is stronger than the addiction to cocaine. Yeah. So one of the ways it harms the mind is that it makes a person addicted. They said that this addiction creates more problems. Of them is anxiety. Of them is depression. Of them is OCD. And then what happens is that a person may go to the doctor and present his problems like depression and anxiety and the doctor gives the drugs. However, the underlying problem is not the depression itself. The underlying problem is the addiction. And so that is a misdiagnosis and the person doesn't get the treatment he needs. This problem is, is causing other problems. There's something else as well. And that is they associate, the brain associates dopamine release with forming new synapses in the brain to do with memory. They said that if a person sees something in a state of pleasure, it will be imprinted not just in his short-term memory, but in his long-term memory too. Therefore, if a person is watching indecent things on the screen in a state of pleasure, the images, subhanAllah, that he sees may be imprint, imprinted permanently in his memory. This is how it harms the mind. In terms of the body, some claim that this sin can lead to ED, yeah, which they say erectile dysfunction. And subhanAllah, and though these the studies have not confirmed this, what has been said is that the number of cases for 40 and below for ED has increased in the last 15 years. And why, and what is the cause of this increase of diagnosis of an age group that don't usually suffer from ED? Some people, like uh, the behavioral psychologist Philip Zimbardo, said it's to do with porn addiction. Yeah, porn addiction. This is one of the ways it harms the body. However, we said that it also harms the way you view the women in your life. And this one, Allah, is um, it's a big one, subhanAllah. If a person watches indecent images, what happens to them? They don't view women as human beings anymore, they view them as objects. Yeah, And the more a person watches this, the more a person starts to see women as objects. There was a study here. Yeah. A study in the Netherlands suggests that the more adult, adult males use porn, the more they confuse real intimacy with porn and thus no longer experienced affection. After a three-month study, a forensic psychologist found that viewing it caused young men to look at their female counterparts as sex objects. Professor Neil Malamuth, an authority on this issue, said, watching extreme porn can become a factor in causing someone to be violent towards women and sexually assault them. Yani the list just goes on and on. 
Some sisters come to the Sharia Council, they ask for a, a khula, a divorce. What is the reason they're asking for a divorce? I caught my husband watching pornography. And I cannot stand to be with him anymore. I am disgusted that he does such a thing. I have children, but still I want to get a divorce. Why? Because my husband does this. I've seen it on his laptop, I've seen it on his phone, I've seen it on his iPad or whatever. It can destroy your reputation in the eyes of the people that love you the most. This is another harm. Also, generally in society, what we're finding is that we are living in a very sexualized culture. In a YouGov survey, 9 out of 10 parents agreed with the statement that society is making our kids grow up too quickly. What does that mean? It means society is pushing them to, yani is stealing their childhood and innocence away from them. Yani this is a, an issue that is on the minds of many people. I remember when I started to work as a pharmacist, a young black girl came to my pharmacy, she asked for laxatives. You know the medicine you take to go to the toilet? She said, I want that. I said, what's your symptoms? She goes, I don't have any symptoms. I said, well, why do you want to buy the medicine? She goes, I just want to buy it. Can I have it? I said, just a minute. I went and asked my colleague, I said, the girl outside, she looks like she's come from a school, she wants to buy strong laxatives. She said, don't sell it to her. I refused to sell it. And then I said, why? The lady told me, this girl wants to use it to flush out the food in her system so she can lose weight. The girl must not have been more than 12 years old. In a BBC radio uh, interview with the behavioral psychologist, she said, we did a survey of girls between 5 and 11 years old. 5 and 11 years old. And we found that nearly half of them have tried to diet. Imagine a five-year-old girl is thinking about dieting. Why? Because the pressure to look a particular way and to have a particular image, a sexual image in the eyes of society has become such a huge thing that young girls as, as low as five feel the pressure to conform and to look a particular way. What has created a society like this where a girl as young as five or even eleven is worried about the way she looks in the eyes of guys? Part of it is the sexualization of this society caused by the rise of pornography. And amongst the harms, as the brother mentioned, is the impact of it on the heart. Yeah. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said that there is a connection between that sight and the heart. Watching an evil is like firing an arrow that goes through the eye directly to the heart. This is the impact that seeing indecent things can have on a person's heart. Kalla bal rana ala qulubihim ma kanu yaksibun. Allah says in the Quran, Verily, a black cover has enclosed their hearts because of what they used to earn. Meaning, because of the sins they used to do in their lives. A person whose heart becomes dark and black, what will this person, how will this affect this person's relationship with Allah? The way it will affect your relationship with Allah is that you will feel your connection has become weak with Allah. And when you, for example, read the Qur'an or listen to a lecture about Allah and His Messenger, والسلام, you will not feel, you will not feel that iman penetrating your heart. Why? Because you have done certain things that have placed a cover on your heart. This is some of the harm, subhanAllah, that this sin this habit can have on a person, on people together in a community and on society in general. Now, we have to be clear on something. What does our religion say about our desires? What do we do about them? 
we don't say that you should be celibate, live in the masjid and not get married and don't fulfill your desires. No, we don't say that. Allah Jalla tells us in the Quran, Qad aflah al mu'minun that believers they have succeeded. How? A number of things. Of them, when it comes to their private parts, they guard them. Except when it comes to their wives, وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ When it comes to their wives, then they're not blameworthy when it comes to satisfying their sexual desires. But whoever wants to go beyond that, then he for sure or they for sure, they are going beyond the limits. And our Prophet Sallallahu told us, يَا مَعَشَرَ الشَّبَابِ O oh, young people, a shabab is like teenagers. Whoever from amongst you can get married, go ahead and get married. This is the advice of our Prophet ﷺ. He was speaking to youngsters, not to people, mashallah, graduated, got the job, got the little house, got the car, and hair is turning grey, maybe it's time to get married now, better. No, 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 no. This is before you graduate. Shabab, youngsters. Why did the person advise you to get married when you're young? Because he feared that you will fall into zina. That is the reason why the person advised us to get married when you're young. And this is part of this is part of safeguarding yourself against the sin of zina as well. The, the problem is that perhaps a person doesn't see the gravity of the sin of watching pornography. Because it is not physically doing the sin itself. Yeah. However, our Prophet told us in a hadith which is classed as Sahih by Shaykh al-Bayn rahimahullah, Al-Aynani Tazniyan. The eyes, they do zina. The hands, they do zina. The legs, they do zina. And then what is left is the private part. And what is really interesting is the way Allah told us not to do zina. لا تقرب الزنا. Allah says in Surah Al Isra, "Don't go near zina." What's the difference between saying "Don't do zina" and "Don't go near zina"? What's the difference? Because the verse before that Allah says, "ولا تقتلوا أولادكم خشية إملاق." Don't kill your children out of fear of bankruptcy. Even though Allah said, "Don't kill your children," there Allah said, "Don't come near zina." Yeah, what's the difference between saying "Don't do this"? If I said to you, "Don't don't drink this water," versus "Don't come near this water," what's the difference? After I said that, I became thirsty. Yes. Say that again. Resisting the temptation, mashallah. Anyone else? What's the difference? You had your hand up. Oh, saying you can't go near it is more of like a threat. Mm. Like your dad says, don't go near the PlayStation, right? Mm. Inshallah. One of the benefits of saying, don't go near zina, is to show us that the nature of zina is such that if you go near it, you'll fall into it. Yeah? And this expresses the love Allah has for us. That He knew something is going to be so harmful. He didn't just say don't do it. He said don't go near it. Because if you go near it, you will end up, you will end up in a place that you never intended to go to. And this is the nature of the sin of zina in whichever form. The full blown form or the form that we are talking about. A person, he doesn't have any intention of watching anything bad online. However, maybe he goes to read the news on a website or maybe check his email and in the corner there's an advert there, you know. Astaghfirullah an image that is uh, and it, it's tempting. That is then clicked on. And then a worse image comes and then that one is clicked on. And then person, one thing led to another and well, he is now watching something which 
which is incurring sin by the second. When a person listens to the advice of Allah and says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا Don't go near it. He says, you know what? I'm going to avoid all of the things that could lead to this thing. When a person does that, he places himself in a, in a more safer position. Also, I was thinking about Yusuf alayhi salam, subhanallah. Yusuf alayhi salam, young man. وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ When Allah says, when he reached the, the fullness of his maturity, when he reached that age, Al-Dahaq said 20 years old, Allah then sent a colossal test his way. The test of Imratul Aziz, the crazy lady who tried to seduce him. Look at this, subhanAllah. Allah told us his age and then told us the test. To show us that this is the worst possible time to have that test. And it came down to this for Yusuf. Either you go to jail or you do zina under coercion, being forced to, under duress. Now imagine, if a person decides to go to jail when they're 20 years old, what does that mean? It means you're not going to become a doctor, sub, first of all. <laughs> Marriage, <laughs> who's going to marry me? I'm inside prison. Career, forget about a career. That's what it means to go to prison when you're 20 years old. He said, He said, prison is more preferable to me than doing a zina. Subhanallah. And that was teaching us an important lesson that a person should not underestimate the gravity of the sin of zina in the eyes of Allah. If it came down to it, you should choose jail over doing zina. Subhanallah. Yeah. Now, inshallah, just a few pieces of advice. I have about nine pieces of advice in order to help a person with this sin. The first is, one needs to appreciate the wisdom behind the prohibition and how much harm it does to a person. This, inshallah, is already spoken about. If you think about how many different ways it harms you, your mind, your body, your reputation, your relationship with other people, this inshallah should be a way of appreciating the gravity of the sin. Secondly, a person needs to recognize the blessings Allah has given them in the form of their eyes and their heart and their mind. We seem to think of these eyes of ours as ours. But they don't belong to us, they belong to Allah. Allah tells us in the Quran that on the day of judgment, these limbs will speak against us. SubhanAllah, imagine. And we will say to our limbs, What made you speak? What made you speak? And we will be shocked. Our hand is talking, our foot is talking, and is talking against us. You did this, you know that. You did this, you took me here. You did this with me. And the limbs will say, Antaqan Allah. Allah made us speak. And that day you will realize that these limbs, the fact that they are speaking, shows that they were never yours, they were always Allah's. And you were making them do things they didn't want to do. SubhanAllah. Thirdly, my brothers and sisters, reflect over the possibility of the punishment that awaits people that are sinful. And this is something we don't do enough. We don't remind ourselves of the punishment that awaits people that disbelieve and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are so many verses in the Quran telling us how bad hellfire is. Of the most horrific is a verse in Surah An-Nisa. Listen to what Allah says in this verse. Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِنَا سَوْفَ نُسْلِهِمْ نَارًا Truly those that belied our signs, soon we will roast them in a fire. كُلَّمَا نَضِجَتْ جُلُودُهُمْ بَدَّلْنَاهُمْ جُلُودًا غَيْرَهَا لِيَذُوقُ الْعَذَابِ أَسْأَلَ اللَّهَ سَلَامَةُ وَالْعَافِيَةُ Allah said, every single time their skins will melt off, we will replace it with a new set of skin so they can continue to taste the punishment. Subhanallah. Imagine, burn victims when they lose their skin 
they no longer feel the pain of burning because the pain receptors are mostly inside the skin allah said when their skins are melted away baddallahum juludan ghayraha place it with a new set of skin other than that skin why lamb of ta'lil in order to liyazuqul adab to keep on tasting the punishment subhanallah wa kana allah azizan hakim allah says and allah is truly almighty and all wise the fourth these are now some practical tips the fourth is a person needs to appreciate that he has to have a long term plan to help himself part of a long term plan is a person needs to educate themselves about islam a person needs to be doing something regularly week in week out whether you're studying whether you're working whether you're a mother whatever the case you know subhanallah and the story of the conversion of of umar ibn khattab radiyallahu ta'ala an he came to the house of his sister you know the story when he was an enemy to islam and her and her husband were reciting from which surah surah at-taha and when he heard them reciting because he was told that go and check out your sister if you want to be an enemy to me your own sister has converted he came in angry and he heard them reciting from taha and then he began to interrogate them how comes they had a copy of surah taha you know why because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in makka at the time where there was rampant islamophobia where you had to hide your islam he made sure that every new muslim was assigned a quran teacher subhanallah in the most difficult times the prophet sallam never compromised on education because it is when you learn about the religion of allah that you begin to protect yourself from the sins in society so this is one this is one important piece of advice also along with this advice is long term you need to look at developing a better company a better set of friends a better set of circles you know they said now the big issue for youngsters is what they call um, sexting indecent images are taken and then they are whatsapp to one another or message to one another who is doing this to each other friends if you have friends like this then believe me these are the friends that will take you to the hell fire and they are friends that are not worth having a person needs to seriously think about the type of friends he wants to have in his life because friends wallahi can become the means through which you attain your paradise allah says to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in surah al-kahf wasbir nafsaka ma'al ladina yad'una rabbahum bil ghadati wal 'ashi yuriduna wajha i'm amazed that this is an advice given by allah to his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not to us by extension is to us allah says to the prophet sallam hold yourself back and be with the people who call on allah in the morning and the night seeking the face of allah imagine the person who is being told keep good company <laughs> if the person who is being told to keep the best of company what then about us yeah what then about us may allah give us good company in our lives subhanallah <clears throat> a practical tip my brothers and sisters when it comes to dealing with the issue is where do you keep your where do you keep your laptop your pc your computer in the house the best place to place it is where other people can see what is going on on the screen the worst place to have it is where no one can see what is going on if you do that you are setting yourself up for problems and a disaster rather position your laptop or your desktop your computer in a place where other people can see what you are doing also you should use and make use of the parental control features on the internet many service providers they give you this parent to control another tip and this is an important one is do not give yourself too much free time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told us that the wolf devours the lone sheep the wolf devours the lone sheep why because 
he was teaching us that when you're alone, then shaitan comes and he becomes your best friend. And then you start to think about weird things. And because no one's there to look and see what you're doing, you end up doing things which you regret. Why did this happen in the first place? Because you decided to spend time by yourself. Yeah, and especially in these times with a smartphone, you can access anything in a number of, in a, in a few seconds, subhanAllah, and in such a secretive way. It's never been more important that, my brothers and sisters, you surround yourself with good people and don't be alone. Yeah, don't be alone. Another, another thing to add to this is to maximize your time doing different things. We don't say that a person needs to come in the masjid and say in the masjid all day. No. A person doesn't need to study Islam all day. No. Everything needs to be given due proportion. But when it comes to free time, fill it with doing things which will occupy you something, at least something good or at least not something bad. For example, sports. A person should have time to you know, play sports, football, squash, badminton, whatever that may be. No problem, especially if you're young. It's dangerous having free time. Fill your time with good things. And of them is sports. Another piece of advice, and this is a little bit sensitive for the married brothers, is <laughs> my teacher gave me this advice himself. He said that we are living in sexual, sexual, sex, and a sexualized society where this thing is everywhere. Therefore, a person needs to increase in the amount of intimacy he has with his wife. Because this will help a person. He said, even force yourself to be intimate with your wife. Because if you do this, then yeah, you will have less problems outside. And to be honest, this is like a good piece of advice. Yeah, person should uh, fulfill his desires in a halal way and in this environment perhaps he should you know, go to some extreme in doing that as well. Uh, perhaps this will uh, protect a person. Lastly, uh, my brothers, a person should never ever give hope in himself and especially not in the power of Allah to change him. My brothers and sisters, Wallahi, shaitan, he takes advantage of our mistakes. You know how? He says to you, you are a messed up person. Now you're going to start praying? Now you're going to wear hijab? Now you're going to come to the masjid? Now you're going to go to listen to a lecture? You're a hypocrite. Shaytan, innahu aduwum mudillum mubin. You know who said that? Musa alayhi salam. You know when he said that? After he accidentally killed someone. فَوَكَزَهُ مُوسَى فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ Allah, the story of Musa is ajeeb. Allah says one day, he saw two people fighting. One of them was from Ben Israel. The other one, uh, the other one was from, not from Ben Israel. And he felt that the Ben Israel, he was being bullied. So what did he do? He came to protect him and help him. And he punched the other person. But he punched him so hard, the person died on the spot. And then after he did that, he said, this is from the doings of shaitan. Indeed, he is a clear enemy and one who is determined to misguide people. Mudil is fa'il. Person who is, you know, that's his business to try and deceive and delude people. Shaitan does this to us. You are a messed up person, you're never going to change. Allah Jalla wa'ala, He tells us, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Don't ever despair of the mercy of Allah. And don't ever despair of being a different person. And that's why I love that part of Musa alayhi salam's story. Because even though he does something which is such a big deal to and imagine to kill someone accidentally is not a minor thing. It doesn't matter what time you live in. Accidentally killing somebody is gonna, always going to be a big deal. Despite making that mistake, he becomes the greatest of the greatest people afterwards, subhanAllah. And that's part of the wisdom of telling us the background of Musa Islam to show us that even though you may not be such a great person today, just know 
Allah is ready to make you a great person tomorrow. And so one of the ways you turn yourself around is by always making istighfar. Wallahi, it is amazing that the Prophet ﷺ, he said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Wallahi, la astaghfirullah, wa atubu ilay akthar min sabi'ina marra. Subhanallah, an nabi He said, I swear by Allah, I ask Allah to forgive me. And I turn to Allah in repentance more than 70 times a day. Imagine our Prophet who has forgiven all of his sins. He says, I ask Allah for that more than 70 times a day. One of the wise people said, the people who make the most istighfar sin the least. People that make the most istighfar, they sin the least. This is a piece of advice, you have to take this. Even if you are doing this sin and it has become part of your life, always make istighfar. Before, after, whenever you think of it, make istighfar. Believe me, it will be like almost the antidote to your sin. And the Prophet subhanAllah, he said in the authentic hadith, if you never sinned, if you never committed sin, Allah would replace you with another nation who would sin so he could forgive them of their sins. Subhanallah. This is how much Allah loves to forgive. Tubu ila Allahi jami'an ayyuhal mu'minun. Allah says, turn to him all of you together, O believers. Allah calls out to us to continually turn to him. The problem is, subhanAllah, we are not turning to Allah. So inshallah, these are just some small tips that can help a person avoid the sin or to deal with the sin if they are suffering from We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify us, our eyes, our hearts, our minds, our body, our society, and to protect us from the evils of this sin. May Allah jalla wa ala protect us all. Ameen. Subhanakul alhamdulillah. Ashadu Allah ila anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alaik. Wa jazakum Allah khairan. Barakallahu fiqh. Jazallahu shaykhan khair al jaza. And Jazakum Allah khair brothers and sisters for attending and uh, listening attentively. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who learn from what they hear and practice what they learn. And uh, just before we conclude inshallah just to remind you about next week's lecture. Uh, it will be entitled uh, Domestic Violence and Forced Marriages. So please do attend and benefit. Jazakum Allah khair subhanakallahum bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfirka wa atubu ilaik.